Welcome to the course, Environmental Impact Assessment. Uh, for the past uh, weeks, we uh, saw the environmental status and then looked into need, purpose of EIA, and evolution of EIA, particularly in USA and in India. Then we also looked at the global timeline to understand uh, what kind of law and policy and institutional arrangements are there and how do they uh, uh, align with the larger objectives. So uh, now we will start looking at law, policy, and institutional arrangements for EIA systems at the global level. So the key reference is the UN Training Manual, Chapter 2. The link is provided in the reference section for you. So the coverage for today would include that uh, we'll be looking into the key trends in the development of EIA systems. We'll look into the foundations of an effective EIA system, like w what are the uh, characteristic uh, or the context which makes EIA effective. Further, we'll look into like the uh, framework of EIA and we'll look at from the legal perspective, from the uh, law perspective, how we uh, apply that. Further, we'll also look at the enabling environment for EIA and uh, like what are the context uh, support that EIA needs uh, for it to be uh, really implemented and reach to the sustainability goal. Uh, lastly, we'll look at the relevance of why we need to really know about the legal aspect, all these institutional aspect, and then we'll also look at certain concepts just for clarification purpose. So the learning outcome, uh, what is expected out of you after completion of this particular uh, session is that you should be able to discuss the key trends in the development of EIA systems, and you may note that this is an evolving system, so you need to take everything in perspective. And then uh, you need to identify foundations of an effective EIA system, or what are those, and then review framework um, for EIA from the legal perspective. Then you should be able to identify the key elements of enabling environment for EIA and sustainability and then discuss the relevance and describe various concepts. You should be able to differentiate between the um, legal policy and uh, the institutional setup, which we'll uh, do, do in due course of time. So uh, recapturing the key trends in the development of EIA system um, in our week two lectures, if you may recollect, uh, while looking at EIA impacts, we saw that EIA systems have become progressively more broad. So there were a lot of things which we talked about how EIA is in, um, uh, being uh, taking newer and newer topics and wider topics here. So uh, it, it's covering wider and new range of impacts and there are multiple levels of decision from local level to the international level. So uh, there are a lot of changes which have happened in uh, EIA. So we see that it's more systematic procedures have been followed for EIA implementation. There are improved quality control, how the, um, like how the standards have to be followed, how the compliance has to be there, and how EIA would be enforced. Further, we see that there's a lot of consideration for integrated approach and like not only taking the biophysical, but as well as taking looking into the social risk, health, and other impacts. Further, we see that um, in EIA, now we have extended framework where we look into temporal as well as spatial um, impacts and uh, which uh, like for the temporal you can see that we have been started talking about the cumulative impact assessment for the spatial we are not just talking at the national level but we are talking at the transboundary level and then we are also talking at the ecosystem level and then looking at also um, looking at the global change. So uh, now there's also increasing concern uh, for uh, making provisions uh, in the uh, framework for strategic environmental assessment, which is also said as uh, called as SEA, strategic environmental assessments, which appears at early stage. So you know about EIA, so SEA uh, appears at an early stage of project design and 
It facilitates the decision on the design and the location from policy, plan and program proposal. So uh, compared to EIA, it comes at an early stage and it allows a lot of flexibility in how you approach your project design. We will look at SEA more in detail in the later part of our lectures and will also differentiate it from EIA. So uh, we see that there is uh, also increasing or it uh, emerges from uh, the concept of sustainability and then the uh, these sustainability perspectives and principles have been incorporated a lot in EIA as well as in SEA processes. And then we also see that now we are starting to have greater linkages of EIA systems with the other planning like urban planning and then also uh, sectorial planning so that all integration is happening and then also with the regulatory uh, system as well as the management regime. And uh, EIA has also become much more institutionalized now. So you may also refer, uh, like in, um, in order to like have a review of the context, you can also see international study of uh, environmental assessment effectiveness, how uh, these systems are effective. We can look at the handbook of environmental impact assessment and the environmental assessment source book. Um, you can look at the updated issue by the World Bank. So uh, uh, let us first uh, look into the uh, foundations of an effective EIA system. So like uh, what really makes EIA effective? Uh, what are the key characteristics which one as a reviewer when you are working on it, looking at a system, reviewing a system, what aspects you should look at? So, uh, uh, so that uh, wherever the EIA is uh, uh, applied or uh, where you are reviewing for the improvement purpose, you can see uh, what makes a system workable and it makes reach its goal and here we mean to say sustainable development goals. So EIA system should have one that it should have clear foundation in law and regulation. So it should have distinct um, um, bases in law and regulation and then it can be uh, really translated into any uh, nation's system here. For example, we see in India, EIA system is well established within the legal system. So on the left hand side uh, of the image here, you can see the Environmental Protection Act, um, which was enacted in 1986 with the objective of providing for the protection and improvement of the environment. So uh, that's uh, how we have the act in place to facilitate EIA system. On the right top, you can see within, uh, uh, within this, uh, the, the ministry is conferred power uh, and uh, the power which you can see the list of powers that include environmental clearance and this I've taken from the ministry site. And um, on the right bottom, you can see notification which specifically addresses and guide clearance process in the country, in our country. So in uh, any EIA system, the framework should provide clear statement of objectives and requirements. So that clarity is very important because it might lead to a lot of interpretation. So uh, the EIA statement, uh, the purpose should be very clear and the what is required has to be clear here. So the Environmental Protection Act 1986 clearly states the purpose. So the purpose you can see the protection and improvement of the environment and for matters connected with it. So it's broader and it really tells that it's concerned with the environment for the purpose of protection and improvement. So I've taken a snip from the Environmental Protection Act 1986 here for your reference. So here we can see in the EIA notification stating which development activities will require environmental clearance. So you have entire list and uh, which have been provided here. It should have like you also see that uh, the EIA should have a mandatory compliance and enforcement. So for which the act is formulated and bodies are set up with the power at central, regional and state level. So uh, if wherever the system is, one needs to ensure that it's mandatory and it can be enforced. 
So, uh, other aspect which we see is that the EIA system should be comprehensive in scope. So, it should allow uh, coverage of uh, all the environmental aspects for the application to proposals with potentially significant impact. So, whatever pr proposal can have significant impact, they, they, they should be ex included in the process. So, your um, system um, needs to be comprehensive in terms of scope. So, uh, in our case, uh, as we had seen while introducing EIA in India, that uh, we follow list system based on category and defined threshold levels. Uh, I have just put, uh, provided the snip of it here. Uh, link is also provided to you for downloading the list here. So, you can see how those categories are defined here and which one will go to which. Uh, level for scrutiny or will not be applicable for EIA. So, that is how we do it, undertake it. So, uh, uh, when we compare this with NEPA, we uh, saw that NEPA uh, had a broader statement uh, which, uh, which is subject to interpretation and um, is supported with guidelines as already seen before. We have reviewed that. So, you see that compared to them, ours is very specific. We follow a list where they whereas they have a system of reviewing it and then uh, considering it for the EIA purpose. So, EIA system uh, should also prescribe the process of steps and activities which will be taken. So, there, should, there needs to be clarity in what, how it will be done. Here you can see EIA notification 2006 provides clearance process. You can see here the stages mentioned. So, you can see the uh, stage like screening, scoping, public consultation and how the appraisal has to be taken, yeah. taken care of. We also saw in NEPA section 102 uh, which defines the procedural requirement for the preparation of an environmental impact uh, statement. I have just taken the snip of for your reference, NEPA document link is also provided to you and we have already discussed that. So, you can see here uh, how within the NEPA, uh, NEPA 1969, the section 102 provides the procedural requirement. So, entire, entire uh, page, few pages are there which really gives you how, what should be considered, how it should be considered. So, those are mentioned in the act here. So, uh, EIA system should uh, also prescribe the procedure and steps and activities uh, which have to be followed. So, here we see that EIA notification and its annexure provides procedure for conducting public hearing. So, you, you see that how uh, public hearing ha can be done here. So, entire procedure has been given here. And uh, further, uh, the EIA system should have linkages to protect. Uh, project authorization, permitting and conditioning the setting. So, all this uh, like uh, uh, who will authorize it, where the permission will happen and then the institutional setup. So, if you recollect that we saw in NEPA uh, the setup of the organization and here in uh, um, India we see that there, uh, there are various sectors which in um, uh, which integrates with the process and then you see uh, CPCB provides support and guidance and then there is also CPCB provide uh, technical services to the ministry here. So, you can see the SNP of, from the website. So, um, uh, that, that was about the foundational element what really makes uh, EIEA uh, effective in any system. So, you saw like range of things which should be there from the legal aspect to the process aspect to the linkages aspect, uh, public hearing aspect. So, all those really make uh, it possible for EIA to be translated on ground. So, now uh, looking uh, further like looking at EIA uh, from the legal perspective what all uh, should be there so that not lot many litigation would happen with it. So, it should cover broad definition of environment and effects. So, um, your uh, act uh, the statement which you have. Uh, should have the broader definition of environment and effect and um, it should identify duty and particularly to avoid mitigate or remedy adverse uh, 
effects arising from any activity. So, it, it should allow you to uh, have those kind of range of duties like uh, there should be no conflict of duty, you should be able to uh, have powers to mitigate or take actions to uh, uh, control the adverse effects. So, uh, uh, you should uh, the uh, statement uh, the system uh, should uh, also provide details for uh, like what EIA report should have and then it should make provision for mitigation measures. Uh, uh, what mitigation measures the proponents intend to apply. Uh, furthermore, you will see that uh, the procedural guidance uh, should also be given on compliance and good practice in applying EIA arrangement and uh, whenever whatever decisions are made, uh, those uh, uh, reasons should be given for their decision, why that particular rejection or improvement or acceptance was done. So, those reasons have to be clearly stated. So, such kind of things when uh, they are clearly explained, then, uh, uh, then it, uh, it safeguards the system from the uh, legal concerns. So, uh, you, you can see here from uh, the snip given here. So, from the Environmental Protection Act. So, uh, you, you will see look at the definition here, range of definitions of the environment provided to you. So, you see how uh, it, it clearly states what all things would be covered here. And then um, in terms of um, all the duties which would be there, so it also lists all the duties here. So, the amendments to the rules, coastal regulation zone, delegation of powers and then how they have the right to have eco uh, uh, schemes, zones and environmental clearance, all these things. You can see, so all, all these uh, duties are clearly stated and uh, it also uh, provides, uh, the act also provides the uh, outline of EIA document. So, this I have uh, taken from uh, the 2006 notifications. So, all the acts are regularly amended to, uh, uh, to make it flexible to accommodate all the changes which are going on. Further, we see that uh, now moving on. So, that was about how we really um, have an EIA system which can be legally protected then um, to a certain extent. And uh, then now looking at the enabling environment. So, what kind of support is needed for EIA? So, um, we see that uh, there needs to be a functional legal regime. So, uh, there should be things which allow functional working and uh, we need to have sound administration uh, so that it can be applied and then the flexible policy making. So, flexibility is very important here because the, uh, constant changes takes place in terms of technology, in terms of relationship, in terms of policy. Uh, and context as well. So, it needs to have flexible policy making and then um, also stakeholders understanding of the aim of the process and its potential benefits should also, uh, that also like stakeholders understanding also influences how the EIA is implemented. Uh, further, we see that uh, political commitment is also very important that there should be willingness to um, uh, implement EIA. And uh, apart from that, in addition to the political commitment, one also needs to have institutional capacity for implementation. Uh, uh, you need to have uh, institutions, you need to have people, uh, the technical capacity, and then you also need to have data and information so that um, all the work can be executed in a quality, quality manner. And then uh, there's also need for public involvement as well as you need financial capacity to undertake it. You would need money, resources, time, people, all of these. So when you are resource channelize this, create an enabling environment, then the EIA can be really implemented uh, to its uh, potential. So uh, now uh, looking, uh, coming to our last segment here, looking at the relevance of understanding the legal policy and institutional arrangements. So, why really as a learner we need to understand that um, and like what direction, what EIA system, different directions it takes. So, um, looking at that, uh, how EIA is applied in any country 
uh, how it meets the goals of sustainable development can uh, and can uh, the EIE be improved through a better understanding of uh, like what kind of arrangements are there. Every every country can have different kind of an arrangements. Some where it can be mandatory and some where it might not be mandatory. So uh, and it would largely depend on context to context. So therefore, it is important for you to understand what different arrangements are there uh, in a country at different levels, which we're going to see in uh, uh, sequences now. So uh, in any country, provisions are made in terms of law. So uh, mostly you will see that uh, for EIA, the provisions or for any, uh, the provisions are made in terms of law, uh, which is a rule. So uh, and then or you also see that uh, provisions are made with respect to policy. And what is policy? Policy is a like set of guidelines. And uh, you also require institutions, uh, institutions which facilitate the activities needed under the goal. So whatever goal you want to achieve. So you would need a law in place, you would need policy in place, and you would need its institutions in place. So uh, uh, further, you would also need procedures. Um, and usually uh, procedures are set like how it will be undertaken, what procedure would be followed. So all of these factors con contribute to the success of EIA. So it is important for you to see the strength and weakness. So uh, whenever you review it, uh, you, you see what strength and weakness, a uh, particular existing arrangement in your country is there uh, and uh, uh, for whichever region you are looking at and how EIA can improve as a tool to achieve sustainable development goal. And each system is contextual, so it's it's uh, very very difficult. Or uh, when you uh, adopt uh, like a EIA system, there will be a lot of significant adaptation required because you cannot really transfer EIA from one system to the another. So. Um, uh, uh, keeping uh, keep in mind that every EIA system is typical, unique to a certain extent. So um, EIA in one country would not be really applicable in the another. So every EIA system reflects political system of its country or what kind of system they have, and one cannot import uh, one EIA framework to the an another context. So, so uh, that one needs to look at. At the same time, um, uh, we need to, at the uh, nas international level, global level, that's a lot of uh, integration which is required because we might be working at the international level, at the global level to meet the larger objectives. So there would be contextualization as well as uh, uh, some kind of standardization. So uh, while you look at any EIA system, uh, what do you really look at? So uh, like you, real, uh, you look at who is the authority responsible for seeking the implementation of EIA procedure. So who is going to do that? Who will have the power to do that? So check um, and review the requirements for public participation. So you should see that how public is participating, how aware they are, how informed they are. And whether it is mandatory or optional procedure, so in your country it could be mandatory or optional procedure as well, so like in India we saw it's by the law and like how it has been taken care of and where all, uh, uh, how the overall procedure is and at uh, where all the quality control is being done. So that all you should review while you look at any system. So uh, while you see uh, uh, one of the key elements, public participation, uh, participation may vary from country to country reflecting different traditions and style of governance. So it will depend on that. Some countries have established a separate EIA authority in uh, other EIA processes administered by the environmental department or the planning authority. So looking at the authority aspect, you might have independent as well as uh, like it could be part of a bigger thing. So no single EIA model is appropriate for all the countries. So not only within country, but there is a need to be coherence between EIA requirements of various governments or agencies. So uh, uh, like you need to have coherence to avoid uncertainty and confusion and uh, like um, uh, expense, added expense for the proponent, the pe people who propose the project. 
So for example, countries receive aid from number of donors, each having its own prescribed assessment process. So all the donors would have different formats. So, uh, and then the proposal could be also at the transboundary uh, level and it would require compliance with EIA procedure for more than two, two or even more countries or states or levels. So, that way is we need, need to have coherence and for example like you have already seen ESPU convention. So um, there uh, you see how different states and different countries would work. So there is some coherence which is needed. So uh, looking at the uh, legal aspect, policy aspect which we will be looking at series of lectures now. So uh, building on some conceptual understanding. So, uh, EIA takes place within the legal and or a policy framework. So, uh, it will have through the legal setup or the policy setup or it can be both. And uh, it, uh, it is mostly is, uh, established by individual countries and international agencies. So, if we quickly want to understand the difference between the two, like what is the difference between the legal and the policy. Law is a formal document and administered by judiciary. So uh, that is like one has to follow that whereas policy is a reference for working of the government. So it is a reference like how they would really go about it and it, it is administered by the government. So laws are established in order to bring justice to society and um, equality. Uh, whereas policy is made for achieving certain objectives uh, by the um, government. And uh, the key element is here, uh, key element here is that non adherence of law is punishable, whereas non adherence to policy does not lead to severe punishment. So, that you need to understand here the difference between the law and policy. So, uh, looking at the international uh, environmental law and policy of relevance to EIA. So, uh, significant developments has taken place in international environmental law and policy which are relevant to or applicable by EIA systems of all countries as you see here. So, uh, they can be uh, like these can be divided into non-binding and binding. So, uh, you can have instruments which can be non-binding instruments. For example, we have seen Rio declaration which is non-binding. So, there was a common concern that uh, people want to uh, achieve the nations want to achieve it, but it was non binding in nature. So, uh, it established important principles for sustainable development, including those which needed to be uh, reflected in EIA arrangement. And then we also see that it also uh, was guided by the precautionary principle. And then there are binding instruments, uh, are uh, these instruments are the legal conventions and treaties. Uh, related to environmental protection at the global or the regional level. So, uh, there are non-binding and then the binding. So, they carry obligations. So, when they are uh, binding instruments, so they carry obligations for signatory countries. So, if we are the signatory, then we are bound by that. That may be met through uh, like that can be taken care of through the EIA arrangement. Uh, legal conventions and protocols that apply specifically to EIA arrangement of which uh, ESPU convention. So, if we are signatory to ESPU convention, then uh, we are bound by that convention. So, uh, EIA is specified as a mechanism for implementing certain ex aspects of both agreements. So, in EIA also you have certain non-binding and certain binding elements. So, more generally it can ensure that proposed action of the signatory act, uh, countries are in compliance with these and other international environmental agreements. So, we have seen all, all the series of those agreements. You may also find that agreements are also classified as green agenda, green list or brown agenda or brown list. So, just for your information, green list uh, covers natural element, brown list is associated with human activities. Uh, you can see the examples here. So, you can see how convention on biological diversity, uh, convention on international trade uh, in endangered species, we had seen all of that before, convention on wetlands. So, these are all green agendas whereas you see the brown agendas for example, like uh, control and prevention of pollution. So, framework convention on climate change uh, which targets on greenhouse gas emissions like and then the protection of ozone layer, then 
uh, control of transboundary movement of hazardous waste, so they all become brown agendas. So, these examples are given to you just for review purpose. So, uh, then uh, we also see that within the legal provisions there are uh, like you have general environmental law. So, you also find these kind of categories and also environmental protection uh, like general environmental law like for example, we saw NEPA and uh, which uh, uh, we have uh, which, uh, which is an umbrella law. So, within that everything else comes uh, and also Environmental Protection Act 1986 is general environmental law um, and uh, these uh, incorporate the EIA requirements and procedure like you saw in the set of duties which were there. And then comprehensive resource management and planning laws are also there like you have New Zealand um, uh, resource management uh, Act which provides how the overall resource should be planned and managed. Then you have specific enabling or framework EIA law. So, that is like uh, European directive. So, then you have comprehensive or perspective law like um, uh, CAEE uh, which is from Canada you see here. So, uh, the, uh, uh, we have already seen NEPA and um, Environmental Protection Act, we can just look at uh, New Zealand Resource Management Act uh, which is internationally, um, internationally the RMA is significant as sustainability benchmark. So, uh, this was formed following years of process of law and government. So, um, RMA is an uh, like umbrella law meaning a collection of law, uh, omnibus law which uh, like it cancelled all other uh, laws and then it came as one uh, umbrella law. And within the single rule uh, per with the purpose of promoting the sustainable management of natural and physical resources. So, not just by the element of EIA, but with all the other management aspect this is taken care of. And uh, section 5 from this act define sustainable management among other things uh, as like what all things need to be avoided, what needs to be remedified and those things. And it also imposes biophysical tests of sustainability on, act, uh, sustainability on activities. Uh, uh, we see that RMA does not define an EIA process. So, like how different different EIA system can vary here you see that RMA does not define EIA pr process. Uh, however, they have detailed guide for good practice issued by Ministry of Environment. So, looking at Canadian Environmental Act CEAA, so uh, uh, this is an example of comprehensive EIA specific law passed in response to the series of legal challenges and uh, ruling on the previous 1984 guidelines order. So, uh, there are certain key aspects to it like it, uh, it has principle of public participation, it is designates responsibilities, it prescribes requirements like what fundamentals we had seen before. Then um, act applies it only to the projects and uh, there is also provision for SCE process here. So, um, looking at the format of the layout of the European Commission we, uh, directive on EIA, we see that EIA directive is a framework law. Uh, this law is binding upon uh, member states and uh, the law sets out the principles and procedures. So, it is also giving principles and procedure and uh, uh, it also leaves certain discretion on the member states that they can create their own national legislation and uh, with regular amendments to directives the processes uh, are refined like screening, consideration for alternatives, public consultation and decision making. So, all these are strengthened. And uh, it also has provision for SEA or for like reviewing the plans and programs um, that they have a formal system for this. So, uh, uh, EIA directives is uh, like is in force since 1985 and uh, applies to wide range of defined public and pri uh, private projects and then the link is provided to you for detailed understanding here. So, and uh, how is the review also it is given to you for further study and then uh, uh, looking at the key provisions like what really uh, European directives uh, have. So, it uh, gives you like uh, remember the fundamentals. So, it gives the broad definition, it has mandatory application um, and then it gives the requirement to submit what kind of submissions have to be done, what kind of informations have to be given and how the alternatives have to be studied and justified 
and uh, how the submissions have to be made available for public comments and what results the consultants get and the content and reason for decision. Uh, so all these aspects are there in these directives uh, which is like fundamental to uh, the uh, EIA system. So we see that it contains all of it. So uh, this was what we covered today um, and we'll be looking more into this, uh, the legal aspects of it. So uh, just to summarize what we covered today, so we looked at the key trends in the development of EIA system, we looked at what, what are the key elements of an effective EIA system and then we looked at it from the legal perspective and also looked at the enabling environment and then the relevance and the concepts of it. So that was uh, for today, so these were the references which we used for this particular session and uh, these are the suggested watch and read for you and uh, please feel free to ask questions, let us know about any concerns you have, do share your opinion, experiences and suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring EIA. Thank you.